Happy Halloween, Spooky Pals. So, do you recall when you were a child just how exciting the idea of Halloween was? Pounds and pounds of sugar, all yours for the taking. But wait, your parents wouldn't let you eat it until everything was inspected. That lingering fear washing over them that a malevolent stranger tampered with the candy. I mean, they were only trying to protect you. Poison candy may seem like a big urban legend parents tell their children to prevent them from getting a sugar high that late at night, but what if I told you it wasn't just a cautionary tale? Let's talk about this guy, Ronald Clark O'Brien, or better known as the Candyman. We've got a Halloween treat, so get cozy. O'Brien lived with his wife in Deer Park, Texas, and their two children, Timothy, aged eight, and a daughter, Elizabeth, aged five. O'Brien was an optician and the deacon at the Second Baptist Church, where he also sang in the choir. He was also in charge of the local bus program. On October 31st, 1974, O'Brien took both of his children trick-or-treating in a Pasadena neighborhood. The neighbor and their two children also accompanied them. After visiting a home where the occupant failed to answer the door, the children became impatient and ran ahead to the next house, while O'Brien stayed behind. He caught up with his group and produced five 21-inch pixie sticks, which he explained came from the occupant of the house that didn't originally answer the door. At the end of the evening, O'Brien gave each of the neighbor's children, his children, and a 10-year-old boy from his church the five pixie sticks. Before bed, Timothy asked to eat some of the candy he collected, choosing the pixie stick. He had trouble getting the powdered candy out of the straw, so O'Brien helped him loosen the powder. Timothy complained the candy tasted bitter, so O'Brien gave him some Kool-Aid to wash away the taste. Almost immediately, Timothy began complaining about his stomach hurting. He ran to the bathroom where he began to vomit and convulse. O'Brien held his son while he vomited and noted the child began to go limp. Timothy O'Brien died en route to the hospital less than an hour after consuming the candy. Timothy's death from poisoned Halloween candy prompted fear in the community. Numerous parents in Deer Park and the surrounding area returned the candy their children acquired from trick-or-treating to police, fearing it was laced with poison. Timothy's autopsy revealed that the pixie stick he consumed was laced with a fatal dose of potassium cyanide. Four out of the five pixie sticks that O'Brien received and passed out were recovered from the other children, none of whom consumed the candy. All five pixie sticks had been opened, with the top two inches refilled with cyanide powder and then closed with a staple. According to the pathologist who tested the candy, the pixie stick Timothy ate contained enough cyanide to kill two adults, while the other four contained dosages that could kill three to four adults. O'Brien initially told police he couldn't remember which house he got the candy from. Suspicions began to grow, though, after learning none of the homes visited that night gave out pixie sticks. After walking the neighborhood three times with police, O'Brien led them to the house that the occupant didn't answer. O'Brien claimed he visited this house before catching up with the group. He said the owner of the home didn't have the lights on, but cracked the door and handed him the candy. He claimed to have only seen the man's arm, describing it as hairy. The home was owned by a man named Courtney Melvin. Melvin was an air traffic controller at William P. Hobby Airport and didn't get home until 11 p.m. on Halloween night. He was ruled out when nearly 200 people confirmed he was at work. As the investigation furthered, police learned that Ronald O'Brien was over $100,000 in debt, equivalent to $520,000 today. He also had a history of being unable to hold a job. In the 10 years preceding his son's death, he held a total of 21 jobs. He was suspected of theft at his current job and was on the verge of being fired. His car was about to be repossessed and he had defaulted on several bank loans. The home had also been foreclosed on. Police also discovered O'Brien had taken out life insurance policies on both of his children. In January 1974, he had taken a $10,000 life insurance policy out on both of his children. One month before Timothy's death, he had taken out an additional $20,000 life insurance policy, despite the objections of the life insurance agency. And in the days preceding Timothy's death, an additional $20,000 was again taken out on the children. 
The various policies totaled approximately $60,000, equivalent to $316,770 per child, for an overall total of $633,540 in life insurance policies for his children. Police also learned that on the morning after Timothy's death, O'Brien had called his insurance company to inquire about collecting the policies he had taken out on his son. After learning that he had visited a chemical store in Houston to buy cyanide shortly before Halloween 1974, he didn't purchase anything due to the smallest quantity available to purchase was five pounds. Police began to suspect Ronald O'Brien killed his son. Police theorized O'Brien had laced the candies with poison in an effort to kill his children and collect the money. They believe he gave the other children the candy in an effort to cover up his crime. It was never discovered when or where he bought the poison. He was arrested for Timothy's murder on November 5, 1974. He was indicted on one count of capital murder and four counts of attempted murder. He pleaded not guilty to all five accounts. His trial began in Houston on May 5, 1975. During the trial, a chemist who he was acquainted with testified that in the summer of 1973, he contacted him asking about how much cyanide would be fatal. Friends and co-workers testified that in the months prior to Timothy's death, he showed an unusual interest in cyanide and how much it would take to kill a person. His brother and sister-in-law testified that on the day of Timothy's funeral, he spoke of using the insurance money to take a long vacation and buy other items. He continued to maintain his innocence. The case and subsequent trial garnered national attention and the press dubbed him the Candyman. On June 3, 1975, a jury took 46 minutes to find O'Brien guilty of capital murder and four counts of attempted murder. The jury took 71 minutes to sentence him to death. Shortly after he was convicted, his wife filed for divorce. Ronald O'Brien was confined to the Huntsville unit in Huntsville, Texas. He was shunned and despised by fellow inmates for killing a child. The first execution date was set for August 8, 1980. His attorney successfully petitioned for a stay of execution. The second date was scheduled for May 25, 1982. This date was also postponed. The third execution date was set for October 31, 1982, the eighth anniversary of the crime, but the Supreme Court delayed the date yet again to give O'Brien a chance to pursue an appeal to seek a new trial. A fourth date was scheduled for March 31, 1984, and his lawyer sought a fourth stay on the basis that lethal injection was a cruel and unusual punishment, but his request was rejected. On March 31, 1984, shortly after midnight, O'Brien was executed by lethal injection at the Huntsville unit. In his final statement, O'Brien maintained his innocence, stating that he felt the death penalty was wrong. He added, I forgive all, and I do mean all, those who have been involved in my death. God bless all, and may God's best blessings be always yours. During the execution, a crowd of 300 demonstrators gathered outside the prison, cheering while some yelled trick-or-treat. Others showered anti-death penalty demonstrators with candy. Ronald O'Brien was buried at the Forest Park Cemetery in Webster, Texas, while Timothy is buried in Forest Park Lawndale Cemetery in Houston. So, next time you think it's just an urban legend, think twice. So, did you guys enjoy this Halloween-inspired true crime? It, I know it's such a sad story, but it's fitting for the season. And it's such a cruel and unjust reason to take such a young life. And it really just rings true in my head that money truly is the root of all evil. People are willing to do anything for money, and that's such a scary thing to think about. So, to all you ghosts and ghouls, be safe out there, have fun, have a happy Halloween, and stay spooky, my friends. I'll see you guys in the next one. Bye!